Welcome to the Bridge Builder Program, an initiative of the Minnesota Catholic Conference, where we help you live your faith in the public arena. I'm Jason Adkins, Executive Director of the Minnesota Catholic Conference, and joining me is our producer and Minnesota Catholic Conference Communications Manager, Kit Zapiniak. Hey, Kit. Hey, Jason. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in again this week. Remember, you can always catch us every week on your favorite Catholic radio station, or if you miss an episode, you can always go to mncatholic.org forward slash podcast. And now you can catch us on our YouTube channel as well. Jason, we've got a great conversation ahead. Who are you speaking with? Oh, we're talking to one of my old friends, Professor James R. Stoner Jr. of Louisiana State University. He wrote a really compelling piece in the online journal Law and Liberty called Vaccination, the Law and the Common Good, really taking an in-depth look of the 1905 Supreme Court case, uh, Jacobson versus Massachusetts, that has become kind of the lodestar precedent of a lot of judicial decisions around COVID-19 and pandemic-related uh, mandates and cases. So we're going to unpack that case and talk about judicial decision-making and the principles that apply with Professor Stoner, who is one of the really great minds in this area. That's great. I know I started to look into it just a little bit, and it'll be a great topic for any of our history buffs out there. It's really kind of fascinating. I'll be interested to hear, you know, some of those parallels that he might be able to draw between that case and where we're at today and whether maybe these longstanding precedents need to be overturned. So anyone who's watching or listening, remember, you can always send us your discussion ideas send us an email. The address is show at mncatholic.org, or just leave your ideas as a comment on the YouTube channel or on social media. I'll be back at the end of the program with this week's action item. I'm now joined on the Bridge Builder by Dr. James Stoner, Jr. He is the Herman Moisa, Jr., professor and director of the Eric Vogelin Institute in the Department of Political Science at Louisiana State University. Dr. Stoner is the author of Common Law Liberty, an outstanding book, And he's also the editor of four books, most recently, The Political Thought of the Civil War. He earned his bachelor's degree from Middlebury College and his MA and PhD from Harvard University. He's been a visiting professor and fell in the James Madison program at Princeton University, and he's taught at LSU since 1988. We brought Professor Stoner on the show to talk a little bit about judicial decision making and the Jacobson case that's being used in all the uh, pandemic jurisprudence. So welcome to the Bridge Builder program. Professor Stoner, it's great to be with you. Well, thank you, Jason. It's great to be here. When you, how, what got you interested in studying judicial opinions and the principle, principles judges use to inform their decision-making processes? Well, I don't know. That interest goes back to uh, uh, when I was in junior high school and uh, studying the first studying the Constitution. I learned about its the way it was written and uh, uh, the process that went into that. We actually wrote one in junior high. I think we kind of messed up student government by doing it, but in any event, we had a constitutional convention and the whole thing. And, uh, and, and um, my interest just sort of um, uh, remained after that. And when I got to a college course on American political thought, it just grabbed me. And uh, uh, I took that. I took courses on um, uh, American constitutional law. I then study political theory as well. And uh, my first book, which grew out of my dissertation, was about uh, the Constitution in relation to political theory. And what I added to it was uh, a study of English common law or some understanding of the way of thinking of English common law, because that seemed to me to be what had grown uh, quite neglected in our constitutional tradition. And uh, that's, that's been my own particular take on American constitutional law to try to understand the common law dimensions of it. And, you know, it's interesting from the point of view of, uh, of, of Catholic things, the common law grew out of Catholic England mm-hmm. and it was a secular law that nevertheless laid left room always. And in a way sort of gently supported Christian, a Christian life and Christian practice. And so many of the, many elements of common law, uh, everything I think from the presumption of innocence, which is so central to it, to something like the definition of marriage or so forth, are coming out of Christian Christian practice and Christian law. You recently wrote a piece that piqued my interest. It was called Vaccination and the Common Good. And there's a whole series of cases involving jurisprudence about how to deal with a pandemic and what are the limits of government power. But 
it touches on this phrase that we hear a lot about, but some people seem to have trouble getting their heads around, including me sometimes. What is the common good? Tell me about that concept. What, what do we mean when we talk about the common good? Some people think it's in, you know, the greatest good for the greatest number of some sort of aggregate of goods, but, but what does it mean in, in jurisprudential thinking? Well, l- let me start with what it means in political theory as I understood it, right? Common, common good would be that uh, which is shared within a society and um, not capable of being broken up and privatized, right? I mean, and yet, and yet, for the classical political theor- theorists, Plato and Aristotle, the common good was virtue <laughs> or the uh, the promotion of virtue among the people and then a people that was virtuous. So in that sense, the common good was everyone's good and it was something shared. Uh, for virtue is certainly an individual thing. You, 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 uh, uh, it requires <laughs> formation, the right formation of character, right? But it's also something where we all have an interest in each other being virtuous. Now, you know, the modern definitions of the common good tend to revolve around money. <laughs> You know, as Rousseau said, if I could quote Rousseau on this broadcast, uh, uh, you know, the ancients always talked about virtue. The moderns just talk about money. And nowadays, people tend to think of the common good as access to the public treasury or something of that sort. But but that wasn't what was originally there. And above all, among the virtues, the one that was particularly important for uh, the common right for the common thing is justice. Right. So sometimes it will even be said that justice is the common good. Now, it's also true, I guess, that in political theory, you could see a kind of tension between justice and the common good, since justice includes distributive justice, right? And giving to each his own and what he deserves individually or what a person deserves individually or what a family deserves or what a firm deserves or what a school deserves. Uh, But... But, uh, uh, and, and there could be some common things that, uh, that aren't divisible in this way. Uh, but but so, so it's a matter of interest to all of us that society uh, be, for example, well-educated, right? Or at least have a, an education that's uh, in, in the basic things needed to live together. Uh, for example, in our constitutional processes, right? And in our constitutional government and our regime and what it stands for. Um, but it also, education is also a private good and, and uh, something which different ones of us would wanna pursue in different ways. So when we get to, uh, to, to jurisprudence, um, I like to say that uh, the common good includes the common law. <laughs> And that in some ways for our, uh, for our founders, there were certain elements of the common good. You can find them in the, pre- uh, the preamble to the constitution, right? Our common defense uh, uh, and uh, uh, our, our general welfare. Uh, those are elements of the common good. Uh, but so is this, this common law, which, uh, which, which would be a kind of uh, reflection of the virtues by which we live, our, our justice, right? Our, our basic understanding of justice as we practice it in daily life. And uh, that's what underlies uh, common law, I think. And, and that would be, I think, what's most fundamental about the common good. Now, in this context, of course, the common good uh, ha- has to do with the question of public health. <laughs> and here again, we've got a situation where we've got to relate public health to individual health. Uh, Back at the time of uh, the passing of Obamacare, I wrote a little piece in the public public discourse. Uh, It was a new journal then, so they let anybody in. And uh, I wrote a little (laughs) piece about uh, trying to think through the question of healthcare. And I I said there that, uh, you know, the, the key thing to understand is that each person's is at least primarily responsible for his own health because no one can make you healthy without your consent, right? I mean, uh, to to be healthy requires that you participate in being healthy. And that's sometimes a matter of diet and and, and whatnot. Now I do qualify that a little bit. I say that for young boys between the ages of 16 and 30, it seems 
they're almost indestructible when they're healthy. And so they, they, they sometimes don't consent to taking care of their own health and they're healthy. But on the whole, most of us, uh, most of us uh, have to make some effort. Certainly as you age, you have to make some effort. When you're a child, you need someone to care for you in that way. But that would be the first principle, right? That, that uh, in understanding health, that it's first and foremost, something that you must take care of. And then I would suppose public health is concerned with those things which, well, again, we, we kind of have in common or ways in which we could harm each other if we're not um, if we're not taking care of our own health, so we might say that just to summarize that a, the, a common good is something in which we can all participate and is not diminished in any way by our participation. And likewise, though the common good um, is often pitted against personal autonomy, the two are not mutually exclusive because uh, theoretically, our own individual participation in the common good should be, you know, consistent with our own individual well-being. Is that a good summary? Oh, sure. I would agree with that. With, with maybe this slight emendation, I don't know if I would say personal autonomy, right? Uh, because I would say we live under a common law to some, uh, to some extent, at least, even though we make all sorts of decisions for ourselves especially in a free society as ours has always been. And a good emendation because, uh, you know, uh, autonomy is, you know, has its own limits and is, is the way in which we frame political issues in the left-right binary. Uh, in America, there, it's the nation where there are only two answers to every question. Uh, but you're right in the sense that uh, it's not even the best framework, but often the one that gets constructed and used in these sorts of conversations. Well, Professor Stoner, how would you say that in terms of the use of the common good to describe uh, Im moral imperatives and uh, the, the judgments of politicians and public officials and the moral exhortations about what we should or should not do during this pandemic, how, how have you seen the common good um, approached and understood properly? And how has it, that term been abused in your opinion? Well, here, here's the thing. It seems to me that as I've been thinking about what's been going on, because I mean, I've been absolutely astonished, I have to say, at the ease with which uh, public officials have decided to impose themselves on our persons, uh, first by this massive shutdown uh, and uh, limitation of people even appearing in public space, then by requiring us to uh, uh, to be masked or, or something of that sort, even outside in some places where it does, it, it never seemed to make any sense, but in other circumstances, maybe it does. Um, and then of course, now with the requirement that uh, uh, in some places that to participate in, in any kind of uh, commercial activity or maybe even to hold a job, um, public officials think they can order, uh, uh, order you to get a particular vaccine. And I, Here's the catch. It seems to me that it's not always that the theory is wrong, but the practice has has been um, has been so disordered. So, you know, the powers that are being invoked are invoked for something like the Black Plague. I mean, they they were designed for something like the Black Plague or smallpox, uh, which were uh, very uh, contagious and very dangerous. Uh, diseases. Uh, it seems to me that this particular disease, at first, we didn't know the level of its danger. Uh, now, it's clear that it's, it's dangerous, mostly to the very old or to those with other conditions. And even then, I don't think that the statistics, the health statistics have yet sorted out. I don't even know if they have a, a good health definition of the difference between dying with COVID and dying of COVID. Uh, for every death is, is simply, as best I understand, is a death by illness that uh, of someone who tested positive for COVID. So, I mean, that person could have five or six different diseases <laughs> and they're counted as a COVID death if if they tested positive for it, but it, 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 it's not, as you might think, when people say people have died of COVID, you would think that was the cause that seized a healthy person and, um, and, and led them and became fatal. In fact, 
as best I understand, again, this is a factual matter. I'm not an epidemiologist. I, I don't claim to any, any, any kind of specific, any kind of professional knowledge on this, just sort of what one can pick up as best one can uh, as the general knowledge of it. Uh, this is a disease that, that is particularly dangerous to the, to the very old or the otherwise, uh, uh, the otherwise ill. And that's serious, but it's a disease that, that is almost unnoticeable in most young people and certainly in children. And the response has shown no or, or very little uh, awareness of that difference, or it took an awful long time for it to, and it's not clear to me yet that it does. That's a good segue into talking about the Jacobson versus Massachusetts case and the application of judicial precedents and decision making. What what was that case about? This 1905 case, um, a, a Massachusetts compulsory vaccination law, but it, it's become kind of the lodestar in judicial decision making during this pandemic on a whole host of questions, church openings, uh, vaccinations, mask requirements, et cetera, et cetera. What was that case about, and why did the justices in that case uphold the Massachusetts law? Uh, the, the, um, the, the case concerned a requirement of vaccination when, when, when uh, demanded by a, um, a public health board in a city uh, when there was a danger of smallpox. Uh, there was an outbreak of smallpox. Apparently, it spread around the country in the first decade of the 20th century. And when it hit Massachusetts, uh, there was a law in place that allowed the poor public health board to require vaccination. Now, at that time, this is not generally known, I don't think, the word vaccination meant inoculation for smallpox. <laughs> uh, that's where the vax comes from. It's from the cow. The cow. Mm -hmm. for cow and it's from yep. cowpox, which was the similar disease, which was discovered that could be uh, could, could stimulate the immune system of people to protect them against this horrible disease, smallpox. Smallpox was a disease that um, apparently killed one in three people who got it and uh, killed them. And then it marked, uh, marked many others and they'd carry those marks on their bodies for life. So uh, it's a disease that um, you can see why there was tremendous concern about it. And even so, the law was you had to be, you had to get the vaccination or pay a $5 fine. And I'm, as best as $5, I, I imagine that would be a fine of $100 or somewhere, maybe maybe $500, but somewhere in that range. It was a serious fine at the time, but not, uh, uh, not an overwhelming fine. And um, uh, this was fought by a, uh, a minister. Uh, I forget the denomination. Um, and he, uh, I think he was Swedish background or something of that sort. He had he personally had a terrible reaction to a vaccine in Sweden when he was a child. And, uh, and so was very hesitant to get the vaccine, but he didn't plead that in the case. Uh, in fact, the court kind of acknowledged that a medical exemption, what, what we would call a medical exemption would have to be given if someone, uh, uh, if, if someone, uh, uh, someone's doctor and authority could could say this is a person who seems to be in more danger of the vaccine than of the from the vaccine than from the disease. But that wasn't what he pled. What he pled was a general personal right, uh, like a right to autonomy, I guess one could say. And the court said, well, no, there isn't such a right that would uh, overwhelm the need to take care of, uh, of public health in a circumstance with a disease like that. Now, I think the court in that case took for granted a couple things. One was the severity of the disease. Secondly, they referred to what they called judicial knowledge or common knowledge. And what they meant by that was long established uh, uh, knowledge of the effectiveness of, small, of, vaccine, of vaccination. It had been around for about 100 years, a little over 100 years at this point, of its effectiveness, of its general uh, safety, and, uh, and, and then knowledge of the danger of the disease. And, and, and so all of that was supposed, I think, in the case and weighed by the justices. Uh, and in that context, they found, and it was Justice Harlan writing, um, 
uh, they found that the uh, the common good in that sense uh, outweighed any other sort of vague uh, liberty uh, liberty claim. It is curious because the case ignores, uh, and maybe it was a fault in the pleading of Jacobson, that it, it ignores the tradition of common law of bodily, if not autonomy, at least control over your body, right? Uh, English law was particularly sensitive to any sort of, uh, uh, any kind of assault on the body. And uh, uh, you might remember uh, how much it celebrates the notion of habeas corpus, right? Mm -hmm. To have the body. <laughs> and, and that means no imprisonment without, uh, without judicial process. Uh, and uh, no, no arbitrary imprisonment. So they, it, that law took, and that was the law in Massachusetts, that took very seriously the ability of a person to just move about freely, ordinarily. That was the overwhelming presumption. And the court doesn't really address that in this case. Um, uh, but I th it, it's in the background. It was in the law. It certainly didn't abrogate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it simply said that common knowledge is, in this case, uh, in the case of a, of a smallpox vaccine, a, a smallpox outbreak, it was serious enough to warrant uh, this law, which would fine anyone who wasn't, uh, who didn't get vaccine. Is the case one about, you know, a, a factually oriented case uh, dealing with that specific issue of vaccines in a smallpox outbreak and should be limited to its facts? Or is it a case that applies generally to the scope of the state's police power to protect I, I, public health? Exactly. I think that's what needs to, uh, I think that's what needs examination. And that's what isn't getting examination, at least in the initial, uh, the, the first cases that came up. Uh, and, and I could say a couple things about that. One is, you know, in the same year as, if you'll let me go into a little constitutional law, in the same year as Jacobson, a few months later, in fact, I think it was argued a week later, later the same week even, um, was the case of Lochner v. New York, which became so famous or notorious uh, for the courts striking down uh, a maximum hours law, I think it was, for bakers that had been established in the state of New York on the grounds of um, individual liberty of contract or kind of individual autonomy in that way. And uh, there were several different dissents in the case, but the principal dissents are by Justice Harlan and Justice Holmes. And Justice Holmes writes this theoretical dissent, which is read by every law student, that says, uh, uh, the Constitution doesn't enact Herbert Spencer's social statics and uh, all these questions about economic regulation are simply to be left to the legislature and not the court shouldn't get involved in. Very general sort of response. Harlan's dissent is a little different. He looks more particularly at the question of whether Baker's health is, is, is threatened by working more than whatever the number of hours, I don't remember if it's 40 or 50 or whatever it was, uh, hours a week. And so he takes seriously the claim of health, it's also a health case, and um, the, the justification that was given, and he pays attention to that. And so he decides in that context, the law was justified, but he doesn't give sort of blanket permission for the state to make any law of this sort. Now, that becomes important uh, about 20 years later. Holmes is still on the court. And up comes a case from Virginia called Buck v. Bell. And Buck v. Bell is a case that uh, achieves notoriety in American law because the court upheld a Virginia law that sterilized uh, those whom they found to be mentally deficient. And Holmes, with his throwaway line at the end of the case, says three, I mean, because apparently this woman's mother was thought to have been mentally deficient, and maybe her mother before her. And he says three generations of imbeciles, imbeciles are enough. Uh, and it's a, it's a case that is now looked back on with some horror by liberals and conservatives alike. What does he cite in that case as his precedent? Jacobson, <laughs> saying he interprets Jacobson there as a blanket and sort of universal uh, uh, permission for the state to regulate health in the same way that he more obviously, and uh, Lochner says the state has a blanket permission to regulate the economy. 
Well, if you're a constitutional law nerd like I am, that's a stunning factoid. And I would also point out in the Buck v. Bell case, the lone dissenter was the great Catholic Minnesotan Pierce Butler. So let me let me offer my own factoid. Well, in that well discussion. good good for Minnesota, but uh, but you know his problem in the case is that he didn't give a reason. <laughs> That's true. There was no Butler written dissent, dissent, and we could have right. the reasons. You know, would have been interesting what his reasons were in that case. Uh, and uh, and so here's the thing: if you use, if you and this others have recognized this too. If you use Jacobson in its widest meaning. That means you're buying into Buck v. Bell, but everybody's repudiated Buck v. Bell. I think even the court has explicitly repudiated Buck v. Bell. So, uh, so that means, I think, that responsibly, if courts are going to use Jacobson responsibly, they have to go back and sort out the difference between what Harlan was doing in the case and what, um, what Holmes was interpreting it to mean. And I think the irony is that Holmes's interpretation, although looked on with horror by, again, all across the spectrum, uh, his interpretation is looked on with horror all across the spectrum in Buck v. Bell. That's the interpretation that Frank Easterbrook right away uh, threw out last summer in the, one of the Indiana cases, the Indiana University case. And, and others, I think, have been kind of taking for granted. Um, Josh Blackman, a young law professor, has been... Uh, working on this more particularly and some of the briefs in these first cases are starting to address it but i didn't see mention in any of the, well it wouldn't be in a case with a stay uh there, there wouldn't be mention of uh, of looking at this precedent but i think what's going to have to happen is the precedent is going to have to be revisited in light of subsequent law that's done all the time now that doesn't mean the precedent will be overturned in that case but it can one has to at least make the distinctions between a 100 year old vaccine that everybody knew was effective and something that was developed, you know, within the last two years using an experimental technology and that uh, increasingly seems to have very limited effect, <laughs> certainly isn't effective in the question or seems not to be effective maybe at all in the question of, of the spreading of the disease. In fact, there's a paper in the Lancet a couple of weeks ago uh, by a German study that says that actually the vaccinated are more apt to spread the disease. I don't know about that, but it just, it, it hardly establishes a differential between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. But one way or another, this is emerging scientific evidence. It's very different from something that's been known for a hundred years. So you'd have to say, well, does the precedent still apply or does it not apply? And then what, what I discovered when I was writing this article is that uh, Justice Rehnquist, Chief Justice Rehnquist in the 1990s actually developed, worked very carefully on trying to restore, I think, some sense of the police power that was not uh, the sort of blanket permission that Holmes gave. And this comes out in the, the Cruzen case and the, uh, the other right to die cases out of Washington uh, where the court doesn't extend <laughs> That I mean, the, 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 there's only the rudiments there again of the jurisprudential thinking. But I think what he recognizes is that there is what he would call a basic liberty right anchored in the common law. And he goes back and cites those earlier cases, a basic liberty right to control your own health. And, uh, uh, and, and that doesn't mean that's an absolute right that can't be uh, infringed upon for matters of public health. But it does mean that it's not, uh, it's something <laughs> in the same way that uh, government can regulate your property, but it has to recognize that it's still your property and they can't regulate the whole value away from your property. The court's been clear about that. That's a taking and that can only be done with just compensation. So you would have to, you'd have to think through what's the proper element of, of regulation. And I, I think that's only beginning to be done now uh, to, to talk about the proper extent to which public health regulation can take place. And then there's the secondary question of who gets to, uh, of who makes those regulations. In um, the Louisiana state case, which has now been vacated, uh, that came down several weeks ago, uh, Judge uh, Duncan had a line where he says at the end, it might be, we'd have to 
you know, go through a lot of argumentation to figure out whether the legislature, Congress has the right to impose a, a vaccine mandate. But he says it's very clear that OSHA doesn't have that right. In other words, it can't just be done by a um, by an agency. Now, that's there's, no, there's no federal police power, right? Well, well, see, the interesting thing is, is that Justice Harlan actually was very important in the development of a of a federal police power. The federal police power, such as it exists, is not a general police power. It's it seems to be the power to police interstate commerce and maybe to do it in such a way as to protect the, the police power in the states. So the key case there is the um, lottery case, Champion v. Ames, which Harlan wrote from the same year, I think, it was, maybe it was the year before, early 1900s. And in that case, the court upheld a federal law, congressional law, that forbade interstate sale of lottery tickets. Well, they were in commerce, so Congress could regulate the commerce, even to forbid it, but not because they could forbid any kind of commerce, but because they could forbid commerce in a moral evil and the states had permission to decide that lotteries were moral evils. And, uh, and, and so I wouldn't say there's no federal police power at all, there is, but I think, uh, look, look, that case, Champion v. Ames is a key case behind the Civil Rights Act of 1964, because what uh, there in that act, the court is saying, uh, I mean, Congress said, uh, you can't discriminate on the basis of race in any transaction that relates to interstate commerce. And that depends, I mean, that's a kind of police, a, poli a federal police power, mm -hmm. uh, because they're not talking about the commercial goods themselves, usually, they are talking about access to it, but they're not talking about the goods themselves, they're talking about uh, uh, the, um, uh, the wrongness of the discrimination. So, so, so it, it is complicated, I think. Yeah. So it, just in terms of, you know, you've articulated well the, the way in which facts dictate whether a precedent should be applied in a particular right. context. Right. But also you're, you seem to be saying, too, that there are some moral principles at stake as well and some and moral issues that guide whether or not um, at least principles of political theory and government roles and responsibilities, matters of personal autonomy, those seem to uh, have some relevance here as well. What are those principles that judges should use when they're determining whether a precedent applies? Well, I certainly think that it's a, th that basic question we started with, the responsibility for one's own health is a moral question, right? I mean, it's a, it's a moral responsibility to care for yourself. And I guess in that sense, that's a moral responsibility. Well, it's a moral responsibility on others, right? To, to help and give care, but also presumably not to interfere with the person's own care for himself, right? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, it would be a, a strange thing if uh, um, the, the government were to try to dictate our diet. Well, I guess it does that in little ways. I mean, it might forbid something that's known to be dangerous to the diet, right? That someone might try to persuade us to, uh, to, to take. But uh, I mean, that's where these things have to be argued out. And that relates, I guess, and maybe this is what you were getting at, the whole question of the morals, the moral elements of the structure of government, right? That uh, it's, it is a moral question, a question of justice, mm -hmm. uh, whether one acts within, whether people in, in, in authority, right, act within their jurisdiction and within their authority, or whether they overstep it. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I think it's sort of a common sense uh, uh, observation that an awful lot of us at least see people overstepping their authority. It's one thing, I mean, it's one thing if it's March 2020 and nobody knows what's going on with this disease and the hospital, there's a threat that the hospitals won't be able to address it. But we're, we're now officially into what, the third year of the pandemic, or if not officially as pandemic, what, how do you call it official? But it's been around now, it's into its third year. Um, uh, there's a lot more that's known and the need to return to uh, our regular processes of government and sorting out who has responsibility for what I think is, is, really, is, is really important. And instead you have mayors and cities issuing all sorts of decrees.
So from a Catholic perspective, thinking about this issue, maybe I'll put it this way very starkly, that we have a, a government in many instances that uh, confine people to their homes, uh, force them to stop earning a living on some level, and now requires them to get vaccinated or get, sh- get the jab to keep their job. So, to, so that we don't fall into the Buck v. Bell trap and say that the police power is merely unlimited because it can do that can do some noxious things. What might a Catholic say in terms of uh, pushing back and putting putting limits on the police power without falling into a kind of libertarian autonomy argument? I think you've already hinted at it, which is understanding these things as matters of justice. But see, yeah. love to hear your response to that. Well, yeah, I think I think that. Uh, uh, a, a, a clear-sighted sense of uh, of, of what I mean, it, it seems to me at, at least this that if it isn't true that those who are vaccinated are much less of a threat to public health than those who aren't vaccinated, this was said at first. It might not even be unreasonable. I mean, if it's a matter of smallpox, but in terms of this vaccine and this disease, it simply seems to be the case now, as best we can tell. Then it seems to me there's absolutely, there's simply absolutely no public health reason to require vaccination. What this was pointed out at the beginning of the dissent in in the uh, Sixth Circuit case, the one that's now controlling, which allows that mandate to go ahead. Um, that uh, the dissenter pointed out that the majority in the case had spoken only of the danger to the unvaccinated of uh, of not being vaccinated. But it seems to me that's not a public health danger exactly. I mean, that's a personal danger. And given that it's a new vaccine, the long-term effects of which cannot be known. I mean, especially for young people, for Pete's sake, we, I, I think we know even, I think anyone would admit that there are more dangers to the vaccine than from the disease, at least up to the age of 30 or something of that sort. I'm, again, I'm not sure the science of this. I'm not sure that the science has even been done on this. It's uncertain, but in general, uh, it, it's just not a disease that affects the young in this way. So it would be a gross injustice to deny young people jobs or education or the like. And yet that's exactly what's being done because uh, it's, it's easy to impose on them. Their whole future is ahead of them. And they're being told no education for you if you don't get vaccinated, no job for you in the future, no future for you if you don't get vaccinated. And yet I think if you press the people who are requiring this, the only thing they could say is, well, if they transmit the disease, it might it might eventually wind up with, because of their contact with someone who is vulnerable. So the fact of the matter is, is that the old are imposing this on the young, uh, imposing something that could be some danger to them. We don't know for sure that this is a safe disease in the long run. We do know it has, we know that the vaccines often have deleterious effects. Uh, 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 And and maybe most of us know someone anecdotally where there's a case. I mean, uh, I certainly do, uh, of a young person. And, and so uh, in that case, it seems to me there's a real injustice going on between the generations on this matter. And, um, uh, you know, though I can understand that uh, a young person who's particularly, well, see, it only would apply if they were less apt to transmit it if they were vaccinated. But now it doesn't even seem that that's the case. So I just don't see the reason at all for anyone who's uh, younger to to even get the vaccine if they had a choice and to force them to get it, uh, to force little children to get it, just seems to me to be way, way beyond clear thinking and justice. And and they're just not thinking about justice. I guess this could be called justice between generations. Uh, And it really does seem that older people, (laughs) maybe it's professors, judges, and bureaucrats, you know, who are uh, working at home with their laptops are limiting life in serious ways for every for other people. And if that's true, with for no reason for no good reason, you see, it'd be hard enough if it was for a reason, and we had to weigh 
uh, the the benefits. But now, if if the vaccinated and the unvaccinated are just as contagious as each other, then it's for no good reason, no reason at all. It seems to me, except um, except. Uh, uh, well, I'm not even sure what the reasons are that they're giving, except uh, to assert authority. So that seems really to be a serious problem. We've been blessed to be speaking with Professor James R. Stoner, Jr. from the Louisiana State University, where he's the director of the Eric Vogelin Institute. Professor Stoner, you've helped us unpack why facts of cases and the facts of an issue are very important, both for moral decision making and judicial decision making, and also helped us underscore the importance of thinking about these questions as matters of justice. So we are grateful for your uh, article, Vaccination and the Common Good, and your appearance on the Bridge Builder program today. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you so much for uh, for having me. I uh, enjoyed, enjoyed speaking. And, you know, we didn't even talk about free speech, although I guess we've been able to exercise it. So maybe maybe if they don't cancel this broadcast or this uh, this podcast, uh, there's just still, a, still hope. <laughs> Well, dig well the jurisprudence of free speech and First Amendment law. We'll dig into that on the next one. Professor Stoner, thanks so much again. He is the author of Common Law Liberty, one of my absolute favorite books of political and legal theory. Highly encourage you to check that out. If you like this conversation, definitely look at Professor Stoner's books and articles, which appear everywhere on public discourse and a number of other places as well. Professor Stoner, thanks for joining us in the Bridge Builder program today. Thanks so much, uh, Jason. And we'll be back in a moment with our practical tip for the week. Welcome back to The Bridge Builder, where we help you live your faith in the public arena. I'm Jason Adkins, and now it's time to dive into our practical tip of the week. Kit, what's on the plate? What can we tell our listeners about how they can live their faith in public life? Yeah, so an, another Supreme Court case that everyone's well aware of, Roe v. Wade, the 49th anniversary of that Supreme Court decision is coming up on January 22nd. And in the 50 years since the Supreme Court's abortion decision, it's safe to say that all of our rhetoric, both sides of the issue, all around, everything's just become very divisive over many years, and we want to help our listeners learn how to approach conversations about abortion in a way that can actually help change hearts and minds. So you can attend this event. It's called Equipped for Life, a fresh approach to conversations about abortion. It's coming up in just a few weeks on Saturday, February 5th at the University of St. Thomas in the Twin Cities. And the training It's provided by Emily Albrecht, who we previously had on the podcast. She's with the Equal Rights Institute, and she's going to provide you with both knowledge of how to respond to common pro-choice arguments and give you the opportunity to actually practice dialoguing on some of those points. So you can get your tickets today by going to mncatholic.org forward slash equipped for life. Jason, this effort to equip people for having civil conversations, it really fits in well with an ongoing initiative that the USCCB has as well. Could you tell our listeners more about the Civilize It initiative? Well, Pope Francis reminds us that politics is one of the highest forms of charity because it serves the common good. It is a mode of evangelization, and we can't forget the why behind our actions and our work and our discipleship in the public arena. So it's not just a matter of what we say, but it's also a matter of how we say it. And that's going to lead people to Christ and lead people to the truth. Uh, Offer them a stone of truth in your hand and people will gravitate toward it, throw it or hurl at them. And it's most likely to drive people away. So Pope Francis really reminds us of the importance of engaging in respectful dialogue of reaching out to offer and create a better kind of politics. And so the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has started a Civilize It campaign, Civilize It, a better kind of politics. Um, You can take the Civilize It pledge uh, at USCCB, I'm sorry, civilizeit.org. Again, that's civilizeit.org, and you can participate in a better kind of politics. And the whole Equip for Life dialogue that we're putting on and the Equip for Life training is a way to practice the art of dialogue on a really controversial and important issue with the goal of not just winning an argument, but converting hearts and minds. Again, it's not just a matter of what we say, but it's also a matter of how we say it. That matters as well. So civilizing it 
in our conversations is a great way to go. Civilizeit.org to take the pledge. The Equip for Life training at mncatholic.org is going to be a great way to do that. So remember to sign up for this outstanding event coming up on February 5th. Wonderful. Thanks, Jason. And again, the address for getting your tickets for Equip for Life, mncatholic.org forward slash Equip for Life. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And if you're listening on the radio, you can always check us out on our podcast, too. Just go to SoundCloud. That's where you'll find it or any of your favorite podcast apps. And you can find us on our YouTube channel for any of our extended conversations. While you're there, make sure to hit subscribe so that you'll always be alerted of any of our latest episodes. If you have any questions or comments, send us an email. The address is show at mncatholic.org. And you can always find past episodes on our website, mncatholic.org forward slash podcast. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning into The Bridge Builder. Appreciate you checking us out. And have a very, very blessed week. And remember to civilize it, civilize it.org. Thanks so much for listening. Jason Atkins, Minnesota Catholic Conference, and for Kitsapiniak. So long and God bless.